much. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Break a leg, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Isabel Bosman, and uh, I will be moderating this session today. I would like to welcome all of our participants and speakers to the webinar, Nuclear Non-Proliferation and the Peaceful Use of Nuclear Energy in Africa. I trust that you will enjoy the next two hours with us and that it will be a very informative experience. Uh, before we kick things off, allow me to introduce Mr. Stephen Grust, Program Head, African Governance and Diplomacy at SIA, to deliver some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Isabel, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world joining us. Uh, I, I think one of the positive sides of being in the Zoom era is that we can really draw in an audience from all around the world in ways that we would, would never have been possible uh, if we were doing things under the old normal. Um, as Isabel said, I head up our African Governance and Diplomacy Program, and our work on nuclear in Africa falls under that program, uh, ably led by uh, Yarek Churiansky and Isabel, who's joined us over the last few months. Um, I must take my hat off to them for, for really uh, helping to put this program on the map and open the discussion about nuclear in Africa, which doesn't, I think there was a, there was a big gap that this program is filling. So we have a number of uh, reports that have been published, uh, including by our two speakers today. Um, and uh, your auntie, Professor Yoanti van Veek, who we've been working with very closely over the last two years of this program. But I'd like to commend uh, both uh, Yarek and Isabel for the work that they have been doing uh, consistently on, on a, a, a difficult topic, a, a, a quite technical topic in some ways, uh, and a quite political topic. And today, uh, as the title suggests, we're going to be looking at two sides of the coin. On the one side, the positive aspects of nuclear energy, uh, providing for energy needs, for medicinal uses, um, and for other non-warlike uh, uh, needs, but then also the what could be the negative side, the, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, uh, the dangers of uh, nuclear facilities, as we've seen in places like, you just need to say, Chernobyl or Fukushima to know that there have been uh, nuclear disasters previously with uh, tremendous costs for humanity and the environment. Uh, and so how, how does all that get balanced? Um, I'm not going to say very much more, but, uh, you know, nu and nuclear is in the news a lot these days. We have uh, at least two states, uh, North Korea and Iran, which are top priority uh, foreign policy priorities for, for the new Biden administration, uh, which is quite reluctant to get involved in, in, in some international issues, but some is international issues are not going away and are very, uh, are very important. And you have two uh, regimes that are uh, determined to push, uh, to push the world uh, to see where it could go. And uh, uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons is, is something that uh, really should seize policymakers. So on that note, I'll hand back to Isabel and welcome you here on behalf of the South African Institute of International Affairs. Thanks. Thank you, Steve, for uh, opening this event for us and uh, for touching on some important issues, um, which I'm sure our speakers uh, will fill us in uh, about more. Um, before we kick things off, allow me to just briefly uh, tell our participants about the Atoms for Development project and our associated advocacy campaign. SIA's Atoms for Development project is the first of its kind in Africa and was formally launched in October 2019. Funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, this three-year project focuses on the nexus between nuclear security in securing global peace and nuclear science and technology for promoting Africa's development, especially in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and Agenda 2063. We recognize that a credible, robust no nuclear non-proliferation regime is essential to facilitate the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Without safe and secure handling of nuclear material, plants, reactors, and waste disposal, Africa's ability to utilize nuclear technology for its developmental objectives is compromised. The project coincides with several global nuclear energy developments, including the entering into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the operationalization of the African Commission on Nuclear Energy, AFCON, of the Pelendaba Treaty, 
and the review conference of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, provisionally scheduled for August 2021, after it was postponed last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The project aims to contribute positively towards enhancing the capacity of Africa's nuclear governance institutions and official oversight bodies to ensure full compliance with relevant multilateral agreements, creating informed civil society engagement in nuclear governance and the development utility of nuclear science and technology, to strengthen African agency on the use of nuclear science and technology for development, and to enhance African norm entrepreneurship and voice in global nuclear forums. As part of its objectives, the Atoms for Development advocacy campaign was launched to promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy in Africa, strengthen relevant bodies responsible for nuclear governance on the continent, improve national level legislation on nuclear safety and security, and to promote public debate on these important issues. The advocacy campaign kicked off last year with the following key issues in mind. Article 4 of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons asserts the rights of all states to the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Nuclear technology can make a significant contribution to socioeconomic development and the attainment of the SDGs in Africa. Many African states are currently working with international institutions and other countries with nuclear expertise to develop peaceful nuclear programs. Civil society and the media in Africa should have greater insight into the commitments that African governments have made under the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and the Pelindaba Treaty, and importantly, hold them accountable. I encourage all our participants to visit the Atoms for Development advocacy campaign site online. I will share the link in the chat box where you can learn more about the project through some key videos and summaries. All publications produced under the project are also accessible through this channel. Today's webinar is taking place at a very important and indeed very interesting time. On 23 January, 2020, the authoritative bulletin of the atomic scientist adjusted its doomsday clock to 100 seconds to midnight. This is the closest it has ever been to the ap apocalyptic nuclear midnight. <clears throat> the world's nuclear weapon states have also not given up spending on their respective arsenals despite the COVID-19 pandemic. It has also become clear that Africa and the world should reassess the energy sector and change the way in which electricity is generated to meet an increasing demand for electricity and to fill the gap where there are shortages. African states are attempting to increase electrification and at least 17 of them are considering nuclear power. Before handing over to our first speaker, here with just a few housekeeping points. To our participants, please rely on the Q&A function to post any questions or comments to our speakers. If you do have a question for a specific speaker, please indicate that as well. And then to our speakers, just ensure that throughout um, your mics are muted while presentations are taking place. Uh, this webinar is divided into two sessions. During session one, we will hear research presented by two speakers followed by a Q&A session. After a quick recess, we will resume with the second session where we will also hear research presented by two speakers followed by a Q&A session. Allow me now to introduce our first speaker, Professor Joansi van Weyck, Professor of International Politics in the Department of Political Studies at the University of South Africa. Professor van Weyck will be addressing us on the topic, Africa, Nuclear Abolitionism, and nuclear disarmament. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, um, Isabel, for your very broad and comprehensive introduction, and also to Stephen for um, um, welcoming all of us. And a good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all our um, speakers and, and attendants. Um, I just want to share my screen um, so that we can have a, a discussion here. Isabel, can you just confirm whether it is um, available? I can see it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, as, as Isabel indicated, um, 
I'm going to speak about um, nuclear abolitionism and nuclear disarmament. And let me also thank Isabel for her inputs and co-compilation of this presentation. So all compliments go to her and all the criticisms can come to me. Um, so just, just as an outline to, to link up with what Isabella started off by referring to the doomsday clock. As you know, this um, doomsday clock has been inaugurated in 1947 as a global measurement of where a number of scientists, a number of, of experts working in the field of nuclear science um, built the, 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 the nuclear um, threat um, globally. So as Isabel has indicated last year, we have seen this is the closest to midnight and they have upheld this, this time, so to speak, um, during their 2021 assessment. So just after that adjustment um, last year, um, on 11 March 2020, we saw that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. This, of course, had a significant impact on international affairs, not only in terms of the movement of individuals, but for us and today, pertinent is that a number of nuclear related conferences could not have taken place. And of course, this had an impact on the nuclear agenda, so to speak, also the to measure the commitments that countries made from previous conferences. And we now see that the NPT review conference has been scheduled provisionally for August 2021, but I have also picked up um, discussions that it may be moved to next year. According to the United Nations General um, Secretary's website, it still seems to be um, for August but it, it is a space that we remain to be seen. And of course, also closer to home, the 2020 Conference of Parties of the Pelandaba Treaty or the African Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty has also been tentatively moved to later this year. We also see that the nuclear ambitions have not um, remained unchanged during the pandemic. This is the latest um, CIPRI yearbook assessment on global disarmament and arms, which was released um, the past um, quarter um, year, you can see that although the, the big nuclear countries, let's say the US and Russia has had slight reductions in their arsenals, we see that states like China, India, Pakistan, and North Korea, well, as, as seemingly according to these estimates of CIPRI have, have increased. Um, in terms of their um, arsenals. So there is still a, a need for these countries in their estimates that they need to have these um, weapons. Um, it is worrisome as, as those that have increased their arsenals are countries that are predominantly outside of the current nuclear regime. So where does Africa find itself in the global nuclear disarmament um, environment? I want to address this issue in terms of four main concepts. The urgency for, for, for global nuclear armament, but also the urgency of African involvement, actions that could be taken, the availability of mechanisms, and then also the, the African agency um, that we can build on and, and some uh, prescription for, for increased African agency. We know that the perennial concerns in terms of global nuclear um, armament maintains. We see the, the, the recent withdrawals from, from the US and from Russia. Um, we have also seen the, the, as I've mentioned, the India, Israel, Pakistan and, and North Korea amb ambitions developing that these countries are outside of the NPT. And we see also that a number of so-called nuclear weapon states are not party to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons um, that entered into force last year or the Ban Treaty. So, so these perennial concerns remain with us. And despite decades long efforts to reduce it, um, these are arsenals are with us. Recent developments that do provide hope is of course the, the entry into force um, of the of the um, uh, ban treaty um, earlier this year, and most recently last week, the Biden Putin summit in Switzerland, um, where we have seen that there have been some commitments uh, with regards to the restart of the start um, three negotiations, and 
um, the, the extension of that until 2023. Of course, it remains to be seen what will be the physical outcomes um, of these um, the, the commitments given here. What has been the significance of these, um, of these developments? A world uh, free of nuclear weapons can be achieved through consistent action. And we've seen that there has been a new narrative, which I will refer to later on, that there is also the role of small non-nuclear weapon states. And of course, thirdly, the role of global civil society that has contributed to this shift in the narrative in the anti-nuclear weapons activism that shifted from banning the bomb to the humanitarian initiative. The humanitarian initiative emerged from effort of small and like-minded middle power states round about 2015 NPT conference, even a little bit prior to that. But the significance of this shift is that nuclear weapons have been cast as weapons with a unique and a permanent humanitarian impact. Not only the weapons, but the production of weapons, the storage of weapons, the sharing of nuclear weapons technology, all of that has a humanitarian impact in the sense that it takes funding away for where it can be used for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Prof. Uh, yes. May I ask you if you could just um, make your slides full screen um, oh. just to help our participants. Sorry for the interruption. It is, it is, it is my mistake. I'm sorry for that. Is that better? 100%, thank you. Oh, apologies for that, apologies. Um, so we've seen that the this, this significance of this narrative shift have had um, implications. For example, we've seen that it has been a highly successful approach that involved global civil society. We see the um, International Campaign Against Nuclear uh, Weapons, ICANN, the International Committee of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies have been very much involved in this process of, of um, of, of putting this new narrative onto the agenda. Um, African states have, have been very much involved in this process from the beginning, most notably Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa. Um, and this involvement has increased significantly as the treaty process progressed. And here, African states have been very important in maintaining the historical common African position on nuclear abolitionism. In other words, no nuclear weapons on the continent. Nuclear disarmament should be complete and should be at a global level. And ideally, nuclear technology should be used for peaceful purposes in support of the African developmental agenda. We've also seen um, the past years or so an African Union resolution on non-state actors and nuclear weapons capabilities. In other words, a commitment by African Union members that states should sign up to the relevant regimes, nuclear regimes that protect all um, radioactive uh, material. Um, what has been the success and importance of this? This shift in the narrative, we have, sorry, I'm, I'm going back, um, let me move on. So the success and the importance of this has been that it has stigmatized the development, the use and storage of nuclear weapons. This is now the ban treaty. As I've outlined, it has also contributed to the democratization of global disarmament uh, politics through the active involvement of non-state actors. We have seen here for the first time the criminalization of the development, use, storage of nuclear weapons. In other words, it is now legally codified in a treaty that bans this. Although not codified in the, in the ban treaty, but underlying it is the immor immorality associated with the development, use and storage. And then of course, here we see the, the, uh, the, the development of a strong normative strategy that could be seen as the normative turn in disarmament advocacy. So, but there still remains work to be done. They should remain, especially, um, um, and the role where African states can play a role as a collective is to contribute to the normative socialization regarding the ban treaty. First of all, the ban treaty has not been ratified by all African countries. Um, similarly, the Pandawa Treaty has not 
been um, ratified by all African states, even though it is entered into force. So there is the role of, of socializing states, not only from Africa, but from elsewhere that, that could see the benefit of, of a world um, free of, of nuclear weapons, but also on the peaceful use um, of nuclear weapons and its benefits. We still see that the, 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 the continent, um, Africa, and, and the leaders within the, the, the various regional uh, economic communities could play a very important role in continental and international agenda setting. Right now, there are discussions within the SADC context of getting some momentum building for a, a regional um, discussion on, on nuclear um, uh, protocol and peaceful use of nuclear protocol that could build be a building block for, for, for other uh, regional economic communities to build on. African agency um, is, is of course very important. Africa has a historical position on, on nuclear abolitionism. We have a track record that contributes to our credibility. And we must remember that the African bloc, be it at the UN or at the non-aligned movement or within the General Assembly is a very large bloc with a significant voting power. So the question is, can the clock be, um, be turned back? We have to take the long view here. And the up upcoming NPT review conference is an important step in holding nuclear weapon states accountable. Nuclear disarmament should form palm part of the post-pandemic recovery um, and um, national and global development plans. A post-COVID world should be one that is free from nuclear weapons, which focus on human development rather than on, on human, human annihilation. The work of nuclear disarmament advocacy is more important now than ever. If I can just go back to some of the um, slides that I have, have, have missed earlier, um, let me just go um, in terms of the mechanism, if I can quickly return to that. These mechanisms are, of course, besides using the, the, the existing legal uh, route, like try, um, 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 the treaty and, and the putting it on the agenda, this uh, one of the mechanisms that I would strongly um, out outline is the one of the socialization element of, of, of the continent. And here, agency, and I want to reiterate this, is that if Africans speak, can speak um, with one voice at the African Union by putting this issue um, of global nuclear disarmament, um, but also on the peaceful use of nuclear energy consistently on its agenda, when it is an AU summit, it will send a strong message that the continent is really serious about this. I think African agency can also go a long way of um, advocating for for global commitments in respect of this. Let me stop here and thank you for your attention. And I would be glad to, to address um, some of your queries on concern. And just as a reminder, please um, have a look at our um, um, website um, for our project. It remains important that we turn back this so-called doomsday clock because it can in the long run have significant development for the progress of the continent. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor van Weyck, for that very insightful discussion and um, for highlighting important issues um, on the, the need for, for the nuclear ban and for also showing us that uh, nuclear weapon states can learn something from Africa. Uh, I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Jarek Turianski, the Deputy Program Head of SIA's African Governance and Diplomacy Program. He will present, be presenting a case study, Africa and the Ban Treaty. Thank you very much, Isabel, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you also to Professor Johansi van Weyck for her presentation. I'm just uh, starting my presentation now. Uh, so just, I think, a little bit of background on uh, these papers as well, uh, which are now both on uh, SIA's website. Initially, when we started this project in the end of 2019, we really looked at uh, focusing on solely the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy on the African continent. 
But uh, as we started uh, carrying out our dissemination uh, meetings, webinars such as this one, speaking to policymakers and stakeholders, we were also being asked a lot about um, denuclearization efforts in terms of nuclear weapons. So it's in that sense that we decided in the second year of the program uh, to write two papers, one more broadly on global nuclear disarmament, and then the second one, which is the one that I'm presenting today, on the nuclear weapons ban treaty, specifically from an African perspective. So it also provides us with a very nice opportunity uh, to examine so-called two sides of the coin today. Uh, firstly, to look at the dangers of nuclear energy, and then look at how nuclear energy can be harnessed for peaceful developmental outcomes. So there is, um, there are going to be some cross-cutting uh, points between uh, Professor van Weyck's presentation and mine. Uh, like I said, we worked on these papers together and then uh, nuclear ban treaty, uh, the, the ban treaty is really uh, a case study uh, for the overall global disarmament effort. So what is the current situation? And uh, uh, obviously, Prof. Van Weyck had a very nice slide, which uh, looked at it per country in terms of which countries have how many nuclear uh, weapons. So the current disarmament efforts are unfortunately rather slow. Uh, they were uh, 13,865 nuclear warheads in 2019. It decreased to 13,400 last year, and then further uh, 13,080 uh, this year. So we're looking at a uh, hundreds, a uh, couple of hundred rather than uh, thousands. And unfortunately, against this background, uh, countries like China, the US and Russia are continuing to modernize their uh, nuclear arsenals. Uh, some of the other uh, nuclear states, uh, such as the Democratic People's Republics of Korea, uh, during COVID has unveiled uh, three new missiles. Uh, and this is obviously against the background of um, uh, military rhetoric uh, on uh, behalf of Kim Jong-un uh, and uh, threats against the United States and other countries. We also have Iran uh, that has in 2001 produced 2.4 kilograms of highly enriched uranium of 60% purity, which is just below the thresholds that's used in nuclear bombs. So overall, it's a situation between the haves and they have not. Obviously, the international uh, system is not fair, and that's also applicable to nuclear weapons. You have countries that uh, have nuclear weapons, but they don't want others uh, to have nuclear weapons. And uh, states like uh, North Korea, uh, states like Iran uh, feel insecure in um, the international system, and that's also one of the reasons why they are trying to acquire such weapons. They can also look at examples of, uh, for instance, regime change in, in Iraq. Uh, they can look at the uh, invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, obviously a country that's also given up its uh, nuclear weapons voluntarily, together with Belarus and uh, Kazakhstan following the dissolution of uh, uh, Soviet Union in, in 91. Uh, and in spite of uh, security assurances, uh, for giving up uh, nuclear weapons, uh, they did not materialize in uh, 2014 when Crimea was annexed and uh, the east of uh, Ukraine was invaded by its neighbor. So comes in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW or the Ban Treaty uh, for short. This is a recent development. It's uh, reached the required threshold of 50 ratifications and entered into force on the 22nd of January this year. So it's a very recent um, development. It's seen as uh, Professor Van Weyck alluded to as an important milestone in nuclear disarmament. But uh, once again, some of the key nuclear states, including US, France, the UK, Russia, and China, uh, not being signatories uh, to this treaty. Um, from the African perspective, 29 African countries have signed it, but only nine have ratified it. Here we've got a very nice uh, infographics that uh, SIA's uh, communications department 
helped us to produce. So thank you to uh, Nikki and Spiwe for that, uh, which shows the status in Africa of the signatures and ratifications on the banned treaty that's as of uh, January this year. So here you can see that very, very few unfortunately ratified and it's not enough to, to just sign. Uh, it needs to be ratified and we see uh, quite, a, quite a big chunk of uh, states in Southern Africa and then a few in, uh, in Central Africa as well ratifying it. Uh, but nine out of 29, that's uh, about a third. So uh, unfortunately, uh, not enough. Uh, countries that have ratified it in Africa, Benin, uh, Botswana, Central African Republic, Comoros, the Gambia, Lesotho, Namibia, Nigeria, and South Africa. I also thought it was important to um, bring up that four of these, uh, Benin, Botswana, Lesotho, and Nigeria, ratified it during the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously, uh, the health pandemic was a, a major disruptor of uh, everything uh, from our social lives to international affairs. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, as I've also mentioned, uh, North Korea has unfortunately continued with its uh, uh, nuclear weapon effort. But at the same time, let's also look at the positive side with um, four prominent African countries taking the time to ratify this treaty in the midst of um, this pandemic. As mentioned, 29 others uh, have signed it in total. And just to uh, compare and contrast this to the Treaty of uh, Pelindaba, uh, which was signed by 52 African states, and then 42 of those have ratified it. Obviously, it's a, a treaty that's been around for um, a, a larger number of years. But still, uh, the fact remains that we do need to see more uh, political will on behalf of African states to ratify it uh, and then solidify the continent's status as a nuclear weapons-free zone. So Africa is already uh, a nuclear weapons-free zone as per the Pelindaba Treaty, which entered into force on the 15th of July, 2009. Uh, so we are looking at uh, uh, as an anniversary uh, next month on the, on the 15th of July. And uh, Africa's uh, role in the Ban Treaty was quite significant. Uh, three regional powerhouses, continental powerhouses, Egypt, South Africa, and Nigeria, were involved in the diplomatic process, which led to the humanitarian initiative in 2010, which is seen as one of the precursors of the Ban Treaty. And other African states uh, also supported the notion of a total ban on nuclear weapons six years ago in 2015 at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. Apart from that, the Africa bloc at the UN, which is the largest one, also uh, provided some visibility and uh, support, specifically in terms of adopting resolutions, which eventually led to the ban treaty being adopted. Um, what else can we say about uh, the continent's role in the ban treaty? Uh, AFCON, uh, which is the um, main uh, continental institution in terms of nuclear governance on the African continent, and is obviously the uh, enforcer uh, and implementer of the Pelindaba Treaty, sees it as one that's reinforcing uh, to global disarmament, non-proliferation, and uh, it's recently called uh, for African states to sign and ratify the ban treaty. So specifically in March uh, 2018, state parties to the Pelindaba Treaty called on all African Union members to speedily sign and ratify the treaty, emphasizing that this advances international law in nuclear disarmament and is consistent with the goals of the Treaty of Pelindaba. So as I said, it's very much seen as the NPT uh, being the main uh, treaty globally. Uh, in, in Africa, uh, the Pelindaba is, is, uh, Treaty is seen as the main one, but the Ban Treaty, the new treaty, is seen as reinforcing for both. So it's a further uh, affirmation uh, that uh, uh, the world should be rid of nuclear weapons. But of course, there are uh, some concerns. So as mentioned, there does seem to be a lack of political will in ratifying the Ban Treaty 29 uh, signatures, but only nine ratifications. Uh, a key player in Africa 
uh, Egypt is not a state party to either Pelindaba Treaty or the Ban Treaty. Uh, that's got to do with its concerns about um, Israel's uh, possession of nuclear weapons and uh, its desire to establish uh, also a nuclear weapons uh, free state zone in the Middle East. So for that reason, uh, they are not interested in signing either the Pelindaba Treaty or the uh, Ban uh, Treaty. Uh, apart from that, you do see agency of small and middle power states, which included African states, uh, in terms of um, pushing the treaty through, through their various efforts globally and at the United Nations, uh, getting it to enter into force. But the concern remains that um, the main uh, nuclear superpower states, US, UK, France, Russia, and China, are non-signatories. And then other uh, nuclear weapon states, which uh, have a smaller arsenal of nuclear weapons, but an arsenal nonetheless, such as India, Pakistan, Israel, and uh, the PRK are non-signatories either. Uh, in conclusion, uh, just allow me to reiterate the point that the Ban Treaty is an important milestone in global nuclear disarmament. And it's also an important normative framework for African states that oppose proliferation of nuclear weapons and are in favor of using nuclear energy for peaceful developmental needs. And that's obviously what the second part of today's uh, webinar is going to be about. Uh, Prof. Van Dijk already mentioned the NPT REFCON. That was supposed to be uh, taking place in May last year. We were supposed to go, but uh, that is something that was disrupted by COVID. Uh, what we know is it, it should be taking place um, at uh, from the 2nd to the 22nd of August, but uh, uh, it also doesn't seem to that uh, uh, logistics are being finalized, so it can uh, still be changed. But if whether it takes place in August this year or at a later stage in, let's say, 2022, it's important to bear in mind that it's the first NPT conference since the entry into force of the Ban Treaty and also the first one in the era of COVID-19. So the best time to implement change is usually during a crisis. And uh, the pandemic has certainly caused many states to reconsider their norms and future direction in the post-pandemic world. So it provides uh, a new opportunity for states to discuss through the NPT uh, a world free of nuclear weapons with nuclear energy only being used for peaceful and developmental purposes. With this, I thank you for your time. Um, please feel free to contact me. This is my email address and then also my LinkedIn profile. Uh, so you're more than welcome to drop me a note uh, in case you would like to take this conversation forward. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Yarek. Um, that was indeed a very important uh, presentation and I'm sure our um, attendees also picked up on the continuity um, between the, the two presentations. Um, we will now progress into our Q&A uh, session for this part of the webinar. Um, I will start with a question posed by Richard Meisner in the chat box, um, directed uh, at Yarik, but um, Prof. Van Veik, I'm sure you can also uh, pitch in. Um, so he asks, the 2.4 kilograms of highly enriched uranium produced by Iran is below the threshold for using in nuclear weapons. However, I think it creates a false sense of security since it can still be used in the manufacturing of dirty bombs. What are your thoughts? Yes, indeed. And uh, I think that particularly through the uh, failure of the JCPOA uh, agreement, it uh, does seem that Iran is still determined uh, to build a nuclear bomb. Uh, I think they're very good with uh, misleading uh, the international community uh, about their intentions while trying to uh, sort of stay ahead of the game, uh, uh, ahead of the game and uh, create the facade of uh, going uh, uh, about everything uh, uh, according to the to the book and the and the international agreements, but the fact remains that every year they make further progress in terms of um, developing uh, their their own uh, nuclear weapon. So yes, even though it is below the the threshold, it's not it's not that far off. Um, and uh, as the participant uh, has has pointed out, it can still be be used in, in other bombs. But I'm sure that uh, uh, Prof. Van Vijk would also like to, to add to that. 
if I may, um, uh, thank you very much for that. I just posted in the chat box a link to the latest reports on Iran by the um, by the IAEA. Sorry for that. Um, if you want to have a look at that, um, although it is way below weapons grade, I think it is. Um, the, the concern is that Iran went against the spirit of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I, I think that has been in my reading of the of the the IAEA report that revealed that discrepancy has been the most worrisome. So what we need to see now is is to is obviously to to verify um, that the verification of the program and its its progress that has been made and it is a concern of the IAEA that they need to have access that they need to need to be. Um, 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 trust that is built to to the uh, in in this relationship, and we we need to see that the JCPOA is is on track again. And um, as far as I know, that there had been um, some contact between diplomats to get that agreement uh, up and running, and that Iran is also then um, subject to verification, and of course being commit, committed to that. A concern is, of course, that the sanctions that are against Iran. Um, may be strengthened if it does not uh, adhere to that, and it remains to be seen what will be the outcome of this. But please have a look at the at the link um, of the uh, latest reports for your own um, education. I would be happy to answer more questions, though. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yarek and Prof. And Beck, um, for answering that question. Um, there are a few more in the question and answer box. Um, so the first one from Jessica Makela for Professor Van Veik. Thank you for that informative presentation. What do you think poses as a barrier in getting all African states to ratify the ban treaty? Um, thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for, for that question. So far, what we have in our project um, have um, determined is that there may not be enough technical expertise within a specific government. Not all um, African countries, for example, have atomic energy agencies or have radio, radio um, graphic um, um, authorities or whatever. So it seems like there is on the one hand an institutional um, um, limitation on countries. There is a technical limitation. And then also, of course, political in the sense that some countries may not see that this is uh, one of their immediate um, priorities that they need to get onto. Um, the other issue is that it sometimes is, is unique to a country's political process, where a constitution require a treaty in order for it to be ratified, to go through a long parliamentary process. And, and that may be also unique to each country that in terms of its constitutional provisions and um, treaty ratification, that that takes a long time. The other alternative uh, or, or obstacle could be that there is a, a, a lack of an understanding of of that it may be just because the continent is, is a nuclear weapons free zone. So why should it be important to, to sign up to this? Um, and, and I think there the, 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 the socialization process amongst African countries should, should really be very important. In other words, to, to share that, that it is not only a safeguard um, for, for Africa, but also for the greater globe. And then the, the other issue is that there, there needs to be more education, um, um, not only civic education, but also scientific academic education in the field of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes on the continent. And there are a number of initiatives that are, um, um, of course, um, on the continent. Um, there is the South African Young Nuclear Professionals uh, Association that plays a role as well as the um, um, there is a global um, um, a con a continental organization that I think should also become more involved. Um, they are already very active and I would be willing to share um, their links with you um, after I've answered the question. I hope I've tended to that, um, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Van Veik. Um, then another question appearing in the question and answer box is from Nana Fatima Abdul Malik. To Yarik, um, this concerns the reduction in nuclear disarmament recorded between 2019 and now. A three part question. Firstly, um, from which countries are the figures on the slide? Um, what agency 
or authority recorded this and then how was the data collected? Uh, thank you, uh, Isabel, and thank you uh, to the participant for this question. Look, this was uh, open source uh, information that was available on uh, on various sources. Um, I specifically looked at two. There was a there was a statista.com uh, website, and then there was also a, a general uh, report on uh, nuclear disarmament that that I looked at while compiling it. It did, uh, for instance, for, uh, for a country like North Korea, for instance, it had an estimate. Uh, so I think it was between uh, 40 and uh, 80 nuclear bombs. Obviously, a regime like that is not transparent. So uh, it's difficult to uh, correctly determine the amount of nuclear warheads that they have. But you know, using uh, satellite pictures, using uh, information from, from state media, uh, you know, these were guesstimates um, available. So. You know, I don't think that these statistics are, are exact, uh, but uh, they, this, they, they do still uh, point uh, to general trends uh, in, in nuclear disarmament, uh, which are unfortunately that uh, we're seeing disarmament by a couple of hundred nuclear warheads a year rather than a, a couple of thousand. Uh, and as uh, Prof. Van Weyck also alluded to in her presentation, you've actually got uh, countries uh, that are stopping uh, the disarmament efforts that they've had for the past 20 or 30 years because of the current geopolitical situation. Thank you, Yarik. Um, I would like to ask uh, a final question from my side based on both presentations um, to both our speakers. Um, there was uh, quite a, a lot of concern about the review conference being cancelled last year, and um, Prof. Van Weyck has mentioned that it might be again postponed. So I would like to ask, why is it so important for the review conference of the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons to take place at this stage? Isabella, is that to me? Can I answer that? Please go ahead, yes. Prof. <laughs> The, the importance of that is that it is part of a almost like a, a cycle or a rhythm that, that the international community has, that every five years there is this treaty where there is a discussion on the state of global disarmament, nuclear armament, etc., and also on the peaceful use of nuclear uh, um, energy. Um, the reason why it is important is but one of the, the aspects is to hold those nuclear weapon states that have committed themselves to, um, to, to disarmament, to hold them accountable in terms of the progress they have made. Another issue with more pertinent to, to Africa is the WMD free zone in the Middle East. Why it is important for Africa is that Egypt, and I'm sure that um, our speaker will later on speak uh, or refer to that, the, the Egypt has been very important in driving that process, in requiring that the, the, the uh, diplomatic negotiations on the WMD free zone in the Middle East should go ahead. But we know that the elephant in the room has been Israel's nuclear weapons. And the, 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 w, the, the Middle East zone cannot realize unless um, Israel disarms. And that has been a huge concern. And Egypt forming part of the Arab League is, is part of, 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 of the Middle East in this context and has been a driver of previous conferences. The other reason why it should take place is we know that a lot about di diplomacy takes place in the lobbies, in private conversations. And with the onset of COVID, a lot of that personal interactions have been lost where trust could be built, where confidence measures could be, could be done. So we are in a era of, of new diplomacy, where it is important that that conference takes place um, in, in person where individuals can have late night discussions, where there is not screen fatigue, so to speak, because there need to be that face to face um, um, diplomacy that, that is very important in this context where the stakes are for some states extremely high. And it is also important that we do not stretch the nuclear calendar. Remember that by January, the first conference of parties of the ban treaty is set to take place. So I think that some work needs to be done before that can take place. So um, that is part of, of the reason why I see that it should take place sooner than later. 
I, I think just to jump in, I think uh, Prof. and Vike gave a very uh, elaborate and thorough answer. I just want to pick up on the point on uh, uh, corridor diplomacy, uh, so to speak, because obviously um, I think that there's a lot of negative sentiments about these, uh, these big events, conferences. They're seen as, as talk shops uh, rather than workshops, which, which get something accomplished. But there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, like uh, Prof. said, uh, late night face-to-face uh, -face discussions, which is just not possible on Zoom. Uh, and even though modern technology is great uh, to enable us to meet like, uh, like this, uh, at the same time, diplomats tend to be more mistrustful uh, of it because everything goes on record. Uh, and the same goes for, let's say, exchanging uh, uh, messages on, on WhatsApp or Telegram very easy to uh, to do a screen grab, uh, leak information, uh, and 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 obviously that's something that doesn't build uh, build trust uh, either. Whereas in corridors, people can separate themselves, have a quiet conversation, uh, and then you know their respective ministries will 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 take it forward. So obviously it is a uh, it is a major um, detriment uh, to the lack of uh, of physical events, but we just have to monitor and uh, and see what happens. Thank you so much. That was uh, indeed a very comprehensive answer and I think touched on many important points. Um, that brings us to the end of our first session. I would like to thank both our speakers for your presentations. Um, it is now roughly 5 to 12. We will take about a 15 minute break um, and reconvene at 10 past 12. So this gives you some time to get warm, have coffee, and I uh, will see you at 10 past 12 for the second session.
It looks like uh, most of our attendees um, have returned. So I will begin with the second session. Um, the video that just played is also available on the advocacy page um, for those who would like to rewatch it. Um, allow me to introduce now our third speaker, Nox Msebenzi, the Managing Director of the Nuclear Industry Association of South Africa. He will be addressing us on the topic, nuclear energy in Africa. Over to you, Nox. Okay, it looks like we might have lost Nox. Just wait. I think while we wait for Knox, um, we'll just change the order around and uh, we'll um, go to the fourth speaker, um, Ms. Heba Talataha. She's an affiliate with Nuclear Knowledges at Sciences Po, and she will also be uh, presenting a case study, the peaceful use of nuclear energy in North Africa. Over to you, Heba. Uh, hi, Isabel, thank you. Um, okay, so I'd like to start by thanking um, Saya for the invitation and for all these rich collaborations that we've had over the past year and a half. I'm especially grateful uh, to Yarik and to Yoansi for the constant intellectual input on, on my work. Um, okay, so I'm focusing on three North African countries, Libya, Algeria and Egypt specifically their history with nuclear science and technology, and their plans and their proposals for nuclear energy. So all three countries have nuclear research reactors, and while many of their plans for nuclear energy will probably remain unrealized for many years, I wanted to understand and to contextualize these ideas and, and particularly the meanings of these nuclear aspirations. So why do these states emphasize nuclear energy after decades of not acting, and especially despite recent political upheaval? What is the particular appeal of nuclear energy, especially for these oil producing countries like Libya and Algeria and to a lesser extent um, Egypt? And finally, are there any instances of collaboration between these three countries in the field of nuclear research and, and technology? So these are some of the questions that were guiding my research, and I'll start by providing some context on each case individually, just giving an overview of its relationship with the nuclear field, and then I'll move on to nuclear collaboration and finally offer some analysis or reflection on the answers to, to these questions. So I'll start with Libya. Beginning from 1970, Libya's leader, Muammar al-Qaddafi, had sought to establish a nuclear weapons program. 
But at the same time, he also launched a civilian nuclear program. Under the civilian nuclear program, Libya received a Soviet-designed research reactor. And in order to do so, it was required to ratify the NPT, which it did in 1975. During this period, Libya built an elaborate nuclear bureaucracy, training scientists and engineers, and establishing a complex organizational structure for managing nuclear science and technology. Um, and nuclear science and technology in Libya has been used in the medical sector, in the agricultural sector, for the purpose of desalination, for example. Libya has sought nuclear power plants since um, the late 1970s, and the Soviet Union had agreed to give Libya two reactors in the 80s, and the site was selected and everything was kind of done, but then the plans um, fell apart. Uh, at that stage, Libya tried to get Belgium to take over the contract, but it didn't work um, because the US was concerned about proliferation and put pressure on, on the Belgian firm. During this period, Libya intensified its weapons program and became increasingly internationally isolated as a result. And this isolation would only end in 2003 when it signed a deal with the US and the UK and then subsequently signed an additional, the additional protocol of the IAEA. After the dismantlement of its weapons program, Libya increased its focus on peaceful uses of nuclear energy. No concrete pro progress was made, um, partly due to the outbreak of the civil war, um, but even until now, Libyan uh, government entities continue to discuss and to outline plans for a nuclear power plant. So the country's atomic energy establishment, for example, has described the civil war as an obstacle for its ability to function. And there is still this sense that Libyan officials and entities are looking ahead to nuclear energy, even in the midst of this climate of instability. Due to Libya's previous experience with having um, a costly weapons program, the subject remains controversial in the country. And it's not clear that the people themselves are being consulted on the decision to um, research getting a nuclear power plant. Um, so many people have noted that Gaddafi had squandered public funds in pursuit of a nuclear program. And one example is a Libyan analyst who noted that, you know, although there is a trend in favor of talking about building a nuclear power plant, solar energy is much more financially viable and has fewer uh, political and security risks. Okay, I'll move on to Algeria now. Like Libya and Egypt and other states actually um, across the global south, Algeria's efforts after independence were focused on establishing indigenous capabilities for science and technology, including in the nuclear realm. There were discussions to construct a power plant um, starting from 1975 and feasibility studies proceeded in the decade that followed. But until now, these plans have continued to be postponed. Algeria obtained two research reactors in the 1980s and the 1990s, one from Argentina and one from China. These remain operational and have even been upgraded and modernized in the meantime, and they're used in realms um, such as agriculture, industry, and medicine. Algeria signed the NPT in 1995 following US pressure, and it signed the Treaty of Palindaba the following year. Algeria does not have a uranium enrichment capacity, but sources estimate that it has the largest uranium reserves of any state in the Middle East, which is 26,000 tons. Now, discussions for a nuclear power plant um, have not been shelved in, in Algeria. They continue to be um, discussed and were actually pursued with a renewed vigor in the 2000s when officials released these kind of highly optimistic plans to build a reactor by 2020. And the schedule has continued to be pushed back since then. So for example, a 2014 statement declared that Algeria will have a power plant by 2019, but also no progress has been made. There is no suitable location, for example, that was chosen or studied, um, but Algeria has considered cooperating with the Russian state atomic energy firm to construct the power plant, building on an extensive Russian-Algerian history of collaboration in other realms, ranging from energy to weapons. 
So there was a recent uprising in, in Algeria against President Abdelaziz Bouteflika, but the new political leadership has adopted a similar approach to science and technology, nuclear science and technology. So regarding the discussion of um, the power plant, the state has kind of continued to adopt this top-down approach um, to the power plant. And when asked about uh, potential damages pertaining to the construction of a nuclear reactor near residential areas, the energy minister, for example, stated that it would be built according to international standards of safety and security, but gave no additional details or information on what this means in practice. And this resembles the Egyptian context, which is um, the one that I'll discuss next, where information has not always been effectively and transparently communicated to citizens. And in both cases, questions, especially about safety, have been met with a response that emphasizes technical solutions. I should also add that the topic of a nuclear program will undoubtedly always remain a bit controversial in Algeria due to the experience of French testing in Algeria. So between 1960 and 1967, France conducted 17 nuclear tests in Algeria. And to this day, um, Algerian victims from the fallout have not been able to actually get um, compensation. Okay, I'm gonna to move to my last case study, which is Egypt, and which is in the midst of constructing four nuclear power plants, also with Russian firm Rosatom. The construction has not entered the main phase. It's still in the administrative buildings. Egypt's relationship began with the nuclear field in the its relationship with the nuclear field began in the 1950s, also um, shortly after independence. And it obtained a Soviet research reactor in the 1960s, and then another one from Argentina in the 1990s. And again, these deal with medical, industrial, and agricultural applications. And like the other case studies, Egyptian and nuclear research is situated within a larger national matrix, working to fortify local industry, train personnel, and cooperate with um, universities. Egypt signed and ratified the NPT as part of its pursuit of nuclear energy in the 1980s, but it has since become one of the most outspoken critics of the nuclear non-proliferation regime enshrined by the NPT due to Israeli nuclear weapons. It's pushed for the establishment of a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East, um, and this position has been led by Egypt. So Yuansi was talking about this earlier and I'm happy to, to talk more about it in, in the Q&A. But other Arab states have also been uh, supportive of this position. Like its neighbors, Egypt's plans for nuclear energy followed many years of planning for, but failing to realize the construction of a power plant. And in fact, since the 1960s, each of the country's presidents has sought and pursued to an extent plans to build a nuclear power plant. But the project was revived in earnest in 2013 after the coup by uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Egypt's rationale for the construction of um, a nuclear power plant is that it needs to satisfy a growing demand and a nuclear reactor um, is expected to cover five to 10% of the country's electricity requirements when operational. Egypt's population, which is nearly 100 million people, is significantly larger than that of Algeria and Libya with 43 million and just under 7 million, respectively. Um, Egypt is also an oil producer actually, but significantly less so than Algeria and Libya, and it is not a member of OPEC. It relies heavily on oil and gas for its current energy needs. And in 2015, a superfield of natural gas was discovered off the coast of Egypt. And this was the largest ever discovery in the Mediterranean. Um, and last year, its crude oil production hit a record high since um, 1957. So because of all of these factors, many people have questioned the pursuit of nuclear energy at this point in time and have suggested that perhaps at this stage, um, it's largely redundant. The prioritization of nuclear energy over other key reforms also shows the strong political interest in this um, highly strategic industry. 
citizens have criticized uh, the plans to proceed with nuclear energy due to the relative scarcity of water in particular. So as in the other case studies, nuclear is always discussed in comparison to solar, which is perceived as more favorable. Meanwhile, concerns about accidents have been dismissed by officials who emphasize technological solutions as an indication of safety. So Egyptian and Russian officials have frequently emphasized acceptance of nuclear energy as part of the, the, the project, but it has not been always communicated effectively or clearly to the public. And in many ways, they've been treated as recipients as opposed to stakeholders. Okay, I'd like to briefly discuss um, collaboration, nuclear collaboration between these three countries. So outside multilateral diplomacy, successful collaboration in and coordination of nuclear research has been minimal. So these countries do not necessarily have direct bilateral cooperation with one another. The main vehicles of nuclear knowledge sharing in the region are academic conferences. And these are organized by agencies like the Arab Atomic Energy Agency and the Arab Network of Nuclear Regulators, which host meetings that bring together different atomic energy commissions and often include some African states as well. Limits in collaboration can partly be explained by the continued nationalization of nuclear science in each of these three countries, which has been um, the dominant approach in the post-colonial era. Nuclear science and technology are viewed as strategic areas and accordingly heavily securitized, which ultimately undermines the development of transnational collaborative projects. Despite, however, this ostensible, uh, ostensible um, nationalization of, of nuclear science, it does remain heavily contingent upon external actors with technical knowledge. And this limits intra-regional collaboration. So in many ways, North African states ultimately seek to collaborate with other international actors rather than one another. There are also, of course, various um, internal rivalries and political tensions which create limits to such collaboration, such as Egyptian intervention in, in the Libyan war, for example. So I'd like to leave you with some conclusions slash insights. Um, and again, I'm happy to elaborate more on these in, in the Q&A. And I'd like to make three broad points. My first main point is an observation on the popularity of nuclear energy in this current uh, time. So although enthusiasm for nuclear technology has gone through different stages in, in North Africa, plans for nuclear energy have never been completely abandoned and they continue to be reinvoked sporadically. In all three case con uh, country case studies, there was a clear interest in nuclear science in the immediate post-colonial period, a reflection of a context in which states were seeking to develop their indigenous capabilities of science more broadly and expanding on their educational systems and their national bureaucracies. And since the 2000s, there has been a renewed push for nuclear energy in all three states. This is, of course, not unique, uh, but, lar but part of a larger trend in, in the Middle East and Africa. Although the only functional nuclear power plant in Africa is South Africa's, nuclear aspirations abound. And this is something that was also mentioned um, earlier. In the Middle East, the UAE's reactor was also made, um, uh, went live in, in August 2020, for example. So enthusiasm for nuclear energy may be at an all time high, and it continues to feature extensively in future plans regarding energy policy. And in particular, Russia has grown increasingly influential in promoting um, nuclear energy in North Africa, while many analysts see this as kind of a, a larger bid for, for influence in the region. Nuclear energy is being depicted as part of a shift to sustainable development. States that seek to diversify their energy sources away from fossil fuels are looking towards nuclear energy, sometimes in conjunction with other forms of energy, such as solar. However, and this is kind of my main second point, this uncritical depiction of nuclear energy as inherently environmentally friendly may be problematic, especially in these contexts 
where there are severe water shortages. And the Middle East and North Africa as a region is the most water scarce in the world. And this suggests that nuclear energy may be less about establishing an eco-friendly alternative to fossil fuels and more about political positioning and prestige. Political interest in nuclear energy can be related to broader foreign policy objectives, such as regional and scientific hegemony. But reliance on nuclear power comes with various forms of vulnerability and dependence and may not necessarily align with national objectives. And this is especially the case when compared to um, the power generation potential of other renewable energies, which are more affordable and more promising. My third and final point pertains to how nuclear energy has been treated, which is uh, something that I talked about in each of the case studies as well. Um, and that's kind of as a top down endeavor. There are few independent sources dealing with this subject, and most of the information is based exclusively on official statements. In Egypt, even as the project is being implemented, there is still vital information that is not clearly or effectively communicated. Statements in Algeria are similar, suggesting that the government knows best and can handle internally the technical and political dynamics involved in building a nuclear power plant. So while there is a focus on training nuclear scientists and engineers, there is not a focus on engaging civil society. The timelines and frameworks discussed for dealing with nuclear energy have also been highly optimistic or even unrealistic, which suggests that the articulation of these timelines is based mainly on political expediency and um, techno-nationalism. I'll stop here, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope I didn't go over time. I think I did by five minutes. I, I apologize. Oh, thank you, Heba. Um, thank you for uh, that presentation. I think you've highlighted a, a number of important issues and I think transparency um, between governments uh, and citizens was uh, one of the, the key takeouts for me. Um, then I'd like to introduce our, our last speaker. Um, he is now with us, uh, Nox Nsebenzi. He's the Managing Director of the Nuclear Industry Association of South Africa, and he will be addressing us on the topic nuclear energy in Africa. Over to you, Nox. Thank you very much. Um, let me go straight to the to the to the presentation. Let me share the presentation with you. Uh, let me go to share screen. Okay. Okay. I hope you can hear me and see my presentation. We can see your presentation. Um, may I ask you to just um, put it in full screen view, please? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, quite. Thank you. Okay, by way of background, um, 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'll, I'll focus my attention on Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the previous speaker was talking about um, the, the, uh, the Northern African uh, countries. 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa have no access to electricity. 900 million, that in 300 million over and above the 600 million, we have got totally no access to electricity. 900 million, some of them have got access to electricity, but it's too expensive. They will still use uh, dirty and hazardous and un unsustainable energy sources for, for cooking. You typically have situations where people have got electricity for watching TV and refrigeration, but when it comes to cooking, they use coal, they use um, wood, cow dung and whatever at the back of the, of the house kind of thing. 48 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have roughly the same installed capacity as, of electricity as Spain, but they have got 18 times the population in size. 
over 50% of this capacity is in South Africa. Energy poverty is a major issue in Sub-Saharan Africa. Solutions to address this is to be, to be all inclusive. All the sources have got to be brought on board. Africa cannot afford the luxury of uh, being picky and choosy. Um, coal, nuclear, and renewable energy. By renewable energy, I also include hydro. The United Nations uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals, number 17 and 13, they call for access to electricity and taking steps to combat climate change, respectively. And strategic goal number 15 talks about management of forest and preventing biodiversity loss. And so we've seen with the um, 900 million people that use uh, wood for cooking that it is unsustainable. The transition that, the just transition that uh, people talk about in developed countries is a transition from coal and oil to sustainable energy uh, uh, resources. And some people we have taken that to mean transition from coal to renewable. The definition of um, just transition is from fossil fuel based, which are not sustainable and cause um, greenhouse gas emissions to sustainable green technologies. And green technologies are not uh, restricted to renewable energy. They include renewable energy, but nuclear is part of this um, uh, arsenal. In many instances on the African continent, we're talking about transition from wood and cow dung to electricity. We're not talking about transition from coal to, to electricity, which the developed countries have. And most of these developed countries have, develop, have done so on the back of um, coal. Uh, nuclear power development is subject to uh, strict regulation. Um, there has been a lot of discussion in the previous presenters in terms of um, the various uh, treaties and, and, and what have you. We do have AFRA as the research organization uh, for the African countries on nuclear, and then the FNRB as the organization for um, regulating regulatory bodies, Forum for Nuclear Regulatory Bodies in Africa. The factors to consider for nuclear are basically four, I've considered four uh, factors, technical, environmental, economics, and then regulatory. The technical issues, any economy has got what is known as base load. That means the load that, uh, the, the, the power that an, an economy does not go be, below 24 hours a day. That is the minimum required to run an economy. And then it would have peak loads, typically in the morning peak and evening peak, that sort of thing. And nuclear provides that type of uh, base load and is typically deployed 24 seven because the cost of product producing nuclear does not depend on the fuel. So there's no variable cost um, uh, associated with increasing or decreasing of uh, electricity uh, uh, generation. And hence it is typically used for base load. Nuclear power is dispatchable. You can increase or decrease at will. Um, some anti-nuclear people have tended to uh, to call nuclear in inflexible because it is deployed to operate 24/7 without variation. But it can be um, um, varied up and down as, as as one wishes. In fact, in in a country like uh, France which has got more than 70% uh, nuclear power, there are nuclear power plants that are designed to follow the load, the so-called uh, load following um, the plants. Dynamic operation of any system requires some inertia and um, nuclear power plants, because they, they consist of turbines that have got inertia. Uh, so if you lose a unit, uh, the, the other units may very well be able to carry uh, the, the load for some time while the operators switch and, and, and bring in new plant, that sort of thing. Uh, with other forms of energy like solar, um, once you lose a, a plant, there is no inertia, you've lost it. You've lost 100 megawatts, that's it. There's no, the, you, can't, you can't ramp up a solar plant or a, 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 
a wind turbine. You get what you get depending on, on the weather. And the, uh, um, uh, nuclear is avail uh, available 24 7, 365, come snow, come rain, come shine. It is an ideal partner for, for intermittent renewable energy. And so, in, a, in, a, in an all inclusive, as I said before, Africa cannot afford to be uh, choosy. It would need to have some renewable energy, but it would need uh, a reliable energy source that can complement. Uh, renewable energy. When the sun is not shining, you have nuclear that you can ramp up to compensate for the for the loss of load. Environmental considerations: nuclear is clean and green because it not, does not generate greenhouse gas emissions during operation. Um, some people we have tended to confuse green or equated green with renewable. Yes, renewable energies do not generate gas emissions, they are green, but they are not, green is not ex exclusively for, for, um, for renewable energy in the sense of solar and, 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 and wind. Um, the safety of operation of nuclear power plants, of course, the, the three incidents that have happened in, in the history of nuclear, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima, get to be quoted um, left, right, and center. And when you do the analysis in terms of the deaths per kilowatt, um, uh, hour generated or the, 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 the deaths historically per kilowatt, inst in, in kilowatt uh, installation, you find that uh, nuclear is by, by far one of the safest energies um, uh, in the world. It cows down to, to coal and even, even hydro in some instances. So it's got a very small land um, uh, footprint, um, whereas with certain technologies like solar panels and whatever, you need vast amounts of land and, 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 that, and that sort of thing. Nuclear waste is managed adequately. That's one of the criticisms against uh, uh, nuclear. So far, a lot of nuclear waste is still stored on the nuclear plants for very good reasons, for economic reasons. But there has been a lot of research that has been gone into, into finding permanent ways of uh, storing uh, nuclear energy typically underground. Um, we here in South Africa are particularly endowed with very deep uh, mines that have been uh, abandoned. These are opportunities for us to, to look at long-term uh, facil facilities for, for nuclear waste, but we do have a, a facility in the northern part of, um, of, of the Cape, which is a very safe uh, place. And a lot of people think that nuclear waste is just taken away from a nuclear power plant and dumped onto to a, to a site for thousands of years. It is actually firstly treated and reduced to a, to a state where a person can literally sit on top of the canisters in which the nuclear waste has been uh, put in and enjoy a cup of coffee and nothing happens to, to, to that person. So there's a whole process that goes into a treating. In addition to that, there are research that are taking place for recycling of the nuclear waste uh, that we have at the moment so that we can reuse, it still has a lot of uh, uh, energy in it. The economics, of course, uh, nuclear power plants have got high upfront costs, uh, the construction, but the running costs are relatively low. Um, as you've seen that we, you, you, could, you could have um, a, a nuclear uh, roads um, put in into a nuclear power plant and they, go, they, can, they can go for about uh, two years. Uh, some research is taking place on small modular reactors. I'll talk about them a little bit uh, later on. The way you, uh, the, the fuel can be, will only be changed after so many years, 20 or so years. There's some research that's going on. It's not yet commercially available. The funding sources are key. Um, also it's important to have low interest rates as the costs are upfront. So wherever, whoever is funding this, uh, the source of the funding has got to be a low interest, um, not commercial banks. Nuclear um, uh, power plants have a long life, greater than uh, 40 years. And I was, I was reading last week, um, one of the nuclear power plants in Germany, uh, sorry, in Japan, that had been stopped because of Fukushima is, not, is now being recommissioned. Uh, for it is over 40 years old and is being extended for another 20 years. 
So if it is happening in, 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 in Japan where there was Fukushima, it tells you a story that uh, it's, it, it, they have no choice but to have to go that route. And the employment creation of, uh, of nuclear power plants, it, is, it can be shown that uh, renewable energy and, and nuclear would create around about the same number of jobs. But nuclear takes a much longer time to construct, therefore the jobs last longer. Um, and nuclear power plants take longer years um, in operation, and therefore the, their careers for a, for, a, for a lifetime and the children's uh, uh, careers as well. The high level of skills, which is sometimes attributed or used as an excuse to say Africa does not have high levels of, of skills, that is actually a, a myth because a lot of the skills that are available that are with, with Africans are exported are, are taken elsewhere. If you go to a place like UAE, you'll find that a large proportion of the skills that are being used in the new um, nuclear power plant there are from South Africa. So that gives you a story. If you go throughout the world, you'll probably find Africans, Nigerians, Ghanaians, wherever. Um, who form part of this, and they emigrate to these places because there are no opportunities for nuclear um, trained uh, people. So that myth that, that Africa does not have the skills, um, is, it, 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 it can be debunked. The advent of small modular reactors is, is going to be a game changer, and a lot is happening now. So you, you will, will probably address the issues of the time it takes to uh, to commit um, or to construct nuclear power plant because most of most of the the small modular reactors will be predominantly or mostly uh, fabricated in factories um, and then taken to site um, and the the they are done in small increments um, a lot of the grids on the African continent are very small and so. A, a huge infrastructure uh, for generating a, a gigawatts of electricity might not be appropriate. It may be wanting incremental um, installation, 100 megawatts at a time, 200 megawatts at a time, 50 megawatts at a time. Plus, these more SMRs can be located um, away from the sea. Um, for nuclear power plants are typically located on the sea for cooling water sea cooling water, but new, new, uh, much small modular reactors can be located elsewhere, which make them a perfect fit for where they are coal mines currently. They actually use less water than uh, coal plants, um, the, the traditional coal plants. So in the case of South Africa and Malaya, where there's all these new, uh, coal power plants that are going to be decommissioned, it's a perfect uh, uh, opportunity to fit these nuclear uh, small modular reactors. And and Lox, sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Um, no. um, you are over your time. Um, if you could just start wrapping up. Sorry. And cheapest is not always the uh, the, uh, the best. Nuclear is a highly regulated uh, industry, um, and sometimes people will argue that there are not no regulatory facilities on the African continent. I've just spoken about the. Uh, the forum for regulatory bodies and so on. And besides, um, the engagement in nuclear gives Africa an opportunity to up their game as it were, to start playing with the big boys and girls in a, in a sense to, to doing these things that are technologically important. And therefore, in conclusion, uh, beyond the fear, fear mongering and the anti-nuclear rhetoric, the technology provides an opportunity for Africa to address this energy poverty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Knox. I think um, that touched on some important points, um, especially I think your, your conclusion um, summarizes things nicely. Um, we will now uh, proceed with the Q&A uh, section of this uh, session of the webinar. Um, an evaluation form will also be shared with all of our panelists and attendees. Um, if you could just complete that uh, before the end of this webinar, we would appreciate that greatly. Um, looking at the Q&A box, uh, there is a question from Richard Meisner um, addressed for Heba. 
Uh, how many, uh, sorry, how much electricity does the Aswan High Dam contribute to the Egypt's, uh, to Egypt's energy mix compared to the nuclear power plant and the newly discovered oil and gas reserves? Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so gas and oil represent more than 90% of Egypt's energy sources, I believe. Um, and uh, this is followed by hydroelectricity as the third largest energy source, which is 7%, something like that. Um, so Egypt has several hydroelectric, uh, has hydroelectric power through several dams, four on the Nile River and the Aswan Dam is, is by far um, the largest. Nuclear is currently still zero, but the, the statements are, are estimating five to 10%. Thank you, Hiba. Um, then there's another question from Peter Becker. Um, if I could ask Knox, if you could please uh, comment on this first, and then uh, Heba, if you have anything to add. Um, Peter asks, I have read that all countries which have built nuclear power stations to date have done it with the primary motivation of producing material for nuclear weapons. Is this true? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think that is true, although historically, Let's say we, let's look at our situation in South Africa. The uh, nuclear weapons program was part of the apartheid regime, but voluntarily abandoned uh, abandoned that. Um, South Korea um, is busy with the nuclear program. They have no intention whatsoever of going um, the the weapons program. So I think to generalize and say um, the nuclear program was started with a view of nuclear weapons. You, you, you get countries like, like Sweden and Denmark, the peaceful countries in Europe that are not um, warmongering and, and, and what have you, that are uh, in, in, in nuclear Finland, you, you don't get stories that they are, the, the, the intention was to, uh, to, to, to build uh, nuclear um, weapons. So I don't think that uh, generalization is correct. Although there's a relationship, historical relationship between arms and, and, and civil nuclear use. Thank you. Uh, Hepa, do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I actually agree, even though I'm, I'm not necessarily um, enthusiastic about um, nuclear energy and, and how it's necessity for, for many of these countries that I talked about, um, I, I don't see it as necessarily tied to kind of a proliferation concern. And this is especially a case in which they've signed the NPT and they're committing themselves to quite a bit of oversight. So I'm not sure to what extent um, we can actually still say that that would be the case, regardless of you know separate critiques of, of nuclear energy. Uh, thank you to both speakers for addressing that. Um, there was another question in the chat box from uh, Stephen Grust asking Heba, to what extent is the cost of nuclear a factor? Russia's bid to expand nuclear in South Africa would have cost the country many billions or trillions of dollars and was then put on ice. Yeah, so this is a, a great question and it's one of the main critiques in the Egyptian case that nuclear is just too expensive and currently unnecessary at the time of an energy uh, surplus. Um, also, Egypt is paying a lot more in comparison to other countries. So I think it was... 6 billion for, per gigawatt in Egypt versus 3.5 in the UAE. And I'm not positive about the figures, but they're from the Middle East Economic Survey. Um, and, and that goes back to kind of my point about it being political. Um, and repaying the loan to Russia is not that straightforward in the Egyptian case and may cause problems, uh, budgetary problems further down the line. Um, and again, it's almost it's also seen as unnecessary, unnecessarily expensive in comparison to other forms of energy generation like solar um, and like wind, which are also uh, something that the Egyptian government um, is, is investing in. Thank you, Heba. Um, then I'd like to ask a question from my side to Knox. Um, we know that research on uh, small modular reactors uh, is still being done. When, uh, when might we, we expect um, these uh, SMRs to begin operating? And is it possible that Africa could be um, the first location for uh, uh, small modular reactors? It's, 
it's it's highly unlikely that Af Africa would be the first location. We would have been the first location had we continued with a purple bed modular reactor, which was unfortunately uh, canned by uh, the politicians. The the reg regulatory framework in South Africa, for example, requires that the technology that is imported must be in the country. Uh, where the technology comes from. And ideally, there should be a reference site outside of the country. So let's say for argument's sake, the, the technology is going to come from Canada. They would want to obviously to make sure that Canada has got, has installed that technology in their own country. And they have got, they have installed it in another country as a reference plant. Then we, then South Africa will feel comfortable. I think from that, it's, it's just a security, uh, a precaution uh, a type of thing. But our, um, I'm now talking sp specifically about South African situation. When the, when, when the Department of Energy asked for uh, information regarding uh, nuclear, they specifically said, look at small modular reactors as, a, as, pot as potential because of the advantages that they, they give in terms of um, uh, being in, in, in implemented at a, at a pace and scale that the, the, the country can, can afford. Most of the developers of this technology are estimating that by 2028, 2030, they would be operating nuclear power plants. Already the United, United States, um, US NRC, is evaluating um, um, new scale and, and perhaps one other um, um, applicant for licensing. And Canada is also on its way to, to implementing that. But so far, um, there hasn't been any commercially um, uh, available, although the, the promises are, are, very, um, are very high. Thank you, Knox. Um, then two more questions came through in the chat box now, um, both from Noema Grobelor. So the first one um, addressed to both uh, participants. Should African countries be focusing on a nuclear build for electricity generation or rather for other purposes, such as application in agriculture and health? What are the cost implications then for African countries? I don't know who would like to go first. After you. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> um, so I have to say I'm not qualified to necessarily speak on behalf of um, uh, other African uh, countries because my, my case studies are very much North Africa specific. Um, and, and that is a context where there is a lot, or, a lot of water scarcity. And there, the question of a nuclear build for electricity generation is not necessarily um, logical and may require further study, further critique in order for us to better understand this and not just kind of proceed with it as the um, ultimate solution or, or savior. Um, in all of the countries that I've um, studied, there are already um, other applications such as agriculture and, and health. And so these investments have already been made and uh, perhaps that is where they should then be focusing their, their energies on um, improving these capabilities. Thank you, Heba. My, my take is that there should not be an issue of focusing on uh, nuclear for power generation. It is part of the whole unfolding or implementation or use of nuclear technology. Um, here in South Africa, for example, we've got a very viable um, isotope nuclear medicine uh, process. And oh, I mean, we, each, 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 every, every time you go to, 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 to get an X-ray, uh, that is nuclear technology. So we, we up, uh, upload that kind of thing uh, where nuclear technology is being used for agriculture and, and, and what have you. So it's not about focusing, it's about making use of what is available and, 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 and looking at all the opportunities. In fact, if you talk about water scarcity, all the more reasons why you should be thinking about uh, uh, nuclear, because with nuclear technology, you've got an abundance, if you like, of heat that is stored in uranium or other nuclear materials that you can just unleash to boil water and, 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 and condense it as, 
potable water. What the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia have been doing for years, three quarters of the uh, um, desalinated water in the world comes from these two countries. And they've been using their endowed uh, energy resource, which is oil, to boil sea water and make it available to their citizens. So if you're talking about water scarcity, you are actually speaking my language that we should actually have more nuclear power plants that could be deployed for both um, power generation and um, water desalination. Actually, you've got a situation where you can have various loading with water desalination. You don't have to produce the water at the time that the water is being consumed. You've got tanks and what have you. So in an event that you have lost one unit, you can stop the, the, the desalination and convert all the energy towards power generation so that you've got a dynamic system uh, where you can, because you've got your tanks and, and, and your water and, and, and you can have days, if you like, of your storage. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, nuclear power has got to be part, part of the, part of the what, what we look at on the, on, on the African continent. Thank you so much. And um, then just uh, the, the last question be before we wrap things up, if I could ask uh, you, Knox, maybe to just briefly address uh, this question. How can we strengthen nuclear safeguard measures for the peaceful application of nuclear technology? What should African countries be prioritizing and how can they work better together to strengthen nuclear safety compliance measures? In, in many ways, they are already doing that. The co collaboration that they have amongst themselves in terms of um, for a forum for uh, nuclear regulatory bodies in, in, in Africa. It provides them with a forum where they can share notes and comp compare notes and whatever and, and encourage each other. And it also provides some sort of a peer review forum where one doesn't want to do things in the dark. Um, and there is also the International Atomic Energy Agency which is a, a body of the United Nations, which is there to provide that kind of uh, um, helping hand, if you like, to make sure that, especially for countries that are starting the nuclear program for the, for the you know, going there for the first time. So with nuclear proliferation, cooperation amongst countries is very important. Strict um, monitoring of borders, um, screening and, 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 and whatever. We've been talking uh, actually in South Africa about a, a potential for reducing uh, rhino horn poaching by injecting the rhino horns with some kind of an isotope so that if anybody tries to smuggle it out of South Africa, it will trigger um, an alarm which shows that there is a radioactive material. That would discourage um, people who are actually buying uh, these rhino horns, because who wants to consume a rhino horn that has got a radioisotope? Who, who knows what's going to happen? So, so, so there's all these things that we can we we, we can do together as, as a collective, monitoring the borders and, and cooperating. Thank you so much. Um, this brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers present today. You did a stellar job. Thank you for your time and uh, for sharing your research and insights with us. I would also like to thank uh, Sarasa and Ndumi, our events team, uh, for your organization and assistance. And a big thank you also to Nikki and Sipiwe for your work behind the scenes and for updating the website and the social media um, before and also during this webinar. I would also like to extend our gratitude to the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the funding of this project. And last but not least, thank you to our participants for joining this afternoon. Take care until next time.